Welcome to Uncaged. Today we're speaking with Dr. John Draper. John, you're working on one of those areas that is so important, so critical, and I'm really excited to get into it. Dr. John Draper is the president of research and development at Behavioral Health Link. And we're going to talk a lot about what Behavioral Health Link is focused on, but certainly we're seeing this as a, a discussion really about areas like crisis intervention, suicide prevention, and uh, some critical topics that have over the last couple of years, I think, come to the fore a bit more, maybe in a healthy way but certainly one that requires more and more focus and more and more positive solutions. John's going to help us navigate that world. But before we get there, John, tell us a little bit about you and your career. Well, I, Ben, I just wanted to be a psychologist when it all started. I thought just doing therapy is what, what I was going to be doing. Uh, but in 1989, after I got out of my internship and I said, I got to get a job just to even be able to move away from New York City. I was so poor. And I found that the, the job that paid the best was a job that seemed the weirdest. And it was actually being on a mobile crisis team. And that was something I hadn't even heard of. You mean there's actually a, a service that goes into people's homes who have serious mental health issues because they're unwilling and unable due to their illness to go out and get help themselves. So help has to come to them. You mean we can make house calls? I had no idea that there was such a thing. And ben, when I first went on my, my initial visit on a mobile crisis team, a light bulb went off in my head and I said, this, this is actually the way mental health care should, should happen. It should happen mm -hmm. in people's homes where they are living. Um, mm -hmm. Problems are occurring. People come into my office as a therapist. We talk for 45 minutes and then they walk out the door and I see them the next week and they haven't thought about anything we've said typically. Yeah. But when you are in the environment where they are living with the people who are they are living with, who are concerned about them, who are affected by their illness, who are either making it better or worse or could make it better or worse, I'm in their life help, helping them to get better. And I thought this is what we should be doing is bringing mental health into the lives of the people who are who don't have it. And it can't always be done and shouldn't always be done in a clinic. Again, if you think about a person who's so psychotic or so depressed that they can't get out of bed or leave their home, mm -hmm. assuming that they can go out and get help doesn't make a lot of sense. So we weren't building a system for people. And I learned that very quickly, that I could be a part of a system that was for people with mental yeah. health problems. And so at that point on, I said, that's what I want to do is I, I want to get into crisis care. And I went from mobile crisis services. We had really the best team in the city of New York. And we went on to, I uh, went on to then uh, uh, establish the city's first hotline. Uh, and that hotline in 1996 became very much a part five years later of the largest disaster mental health response in the nation's history post 9-11. Uh, we were very much in the thick of the disaster mental health response and were for years. And that led to uh, us having the opportunity to run a national network of crisis centers, which is now known as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline in 988. So I was administering and establishing the network for uh, 988 and National Suicide Prevention Lifeline from 2004 to uh, the liftoff of 988, that three-digit number for suicide and crisis services uh, that launched again in July of 2022. And I left um, uh, uh, when I left in July of 20, actually in September of 2022, I then joined Behavioral Health Link because mm -hmm. I wanted to, to, to start building services that were behind the front door of 988 for right. those who are not aware of what 988 is. It's um, some refer to it and it's not exactly the right metaphor, but they refer to it as, um, as, as analogous to 911. Uh, for mental health. Mm -hmm. I guess the, another way to think about it is that we have built the network of crisis centers, and that's what I did for 18 years, that that network that answers the calls, that's the front door 
But if you had 911 and you didn't have anything behind that front door, no ambulances, no cop cars, no, no jails, no hospital mm -hmm. receiving facilities, that's kind of where we are with wow. 988 is that we don't have sufficient numbers of mobile crisis response. We don't have crisis receiving facilities other than emergency departments. So this is a new frontier that is beset with fragmentation. And there are things that we can do and I can help us do uh, to build those crisis care systems so we have that continuous care and support for people after they make the call so they can recover in the community. You're still relatively new on that journey with Behavioral Health Link, yeah. but tell me a little bit about where you are now with that whole process and uh, what you're seeing right now in, in early 2024. Well, there's still, because it's a wild frontier, so to speak, behind that front door, and their systems are still trying to figure out uh, what is the, the best way to establish uh, continuous crisis care so people don't get lost in the system after they make this crisis call. Um, but there are national guidelines um, for behavioral health crisis care, and lo and behold, those national guidelines were very much influenced by what what was what Behavioral Health Link created in Georgia, uh, along mm -hmm. with uh, the State Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities there. And what they created was kind of an air traffic control system for crisis care. Uh, it started in 2006, it became statewide. And what that means is that you can make one call to one center and that center, which is Georgia Crisis and Access Line, they can make mobile crisis referrals throughout the state. Uh, also, BHL operates most of the mobile crisis services in Georgia. They also can uh, connect people with outpatient services as they need it. They can also find empty beds for people who are who are otherwise would be could be waiting for days, sometimes a week in emergency departments, waiting for a bed. Instead, you could bypass all that through the bed registry. We find the open beds and help people find where's the where's the the, the nearest place they can get those open beds. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, we can follow up with them and make sure that they stay, they remain safe. That that entire continuum of care is what the National Behavioral Health Crisis Guidelines are built on. And what fuels the connectivity of that system, that air traffic control system, is basically a software platform that enables wow. dispatch. So we know where the nearest mobile crisis teams are. And we know uh, where the individuals are who need, who, who, who need help so we can get to them quickly. So That's all of that is, 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 is what we are building and continuing to evolve to fit a system that's still trying to figure it out. And that is, we've got a software system that can help all of you, all of your, your communities build a, a, a net of su support and a network of care providers. Is this make a public resource, uh, the whole thing, or? The BHL platform, the software uh, platform right now, uh, it's it's a proprietary platform. Right. And it is operating now and being used by uh, providers and networks of providers okay. in about 10 states. Got it. Uh, and, and that's evolving month to month. I mean, it right. continues to grow and more and more people are interested. And th what's also true, Ben, is that, um, the entire crisis care system tends to evolve and, and we're learning what are the best ways to deliver the, that crisis care. And so what we're also building into our software platform are those best practices. Um, Bant, for years, I was involved with the Lifeline and we worked with researchers, some of the top researchers from around the world to figure out what were the best practices for crisis call centers and text right. centers? And we established those, um, but there are no such best practices for mobile crisis teams or many of the other crisis care facilities out there. So all of that still needs to be figured out. And as we're figuring that out, we can build those best practices and those guidelines and those reminders and those tips into the software platform. So while me as a counselor and working with you as a client, Bant, I'm reminded as to what I ought to be doing 
what research says I should and could be doing to help you get better. So yeah. most people get the same kind of care. So that's an also an important feature of the tools that we're using and building. Yeah. It is an amazing achievement and it's, I'd say, refreshing to hear the progress that probably doesn't seem like enough to you, probably feels like a drop in the bucket of where you want to be and, and what you want to be achieving. But to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't really even know any of these things existed. So it's great to see that. For one, mental health care is only talked about. I mean, again, I, Ben, uh, when I was in 1989, I thought, you know, what do you mean crisis care? I, if I want to, if I like psychology, I'm going to be a therapist. Right. Uh, that's still pretty much the case where most people uh, in graduate school who are interested in psychology or social work, they're not trained in crisis care or suicide prevention. That is all going to change in the next few years. There's going to be a, a, a growing workforce, just like 911 established a lot more emergency medicine. It established, mm -hmm. you know, a, a pair of uh, paraprofessionals in terms of, 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 of you know, uh, EMS techs. It created uh, not just more police, but also more, e uh, EM, uh, <clears throat> more security personnel. So it's going to create, 988 is going to generate a lot more demand for crisis services, which will generate a lot more demand for staff, which will force uh, much more training and, and, and tech, textbook writing in schools to get people talking about crisis care. But it's not something that people are talking about yet. Yeah, no, it's been something that I've noticed, obviously, throughout my whole life has always been, it's been in the shadows and something that uh, people are almost worried of doing it wrong. So they don't do anything. That's always, I think, uh, that dilemma, which is how do we get people comfortable enough with the space so that we can help and assist them and then make sure that it's done in a way where it's not perceived as in any type of a negative or offering up some form of a stigma. I would say that, John, over the last decade, especially during things like the pandemic, when there wasn't a person on the planet that didn't have some type of a mental illness. And if you didn't, you were, <laughs> that was probably your mental illness, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that people are more open than ever before to exploring, addressing and coming up with better solutions. But I mean, what are, what are you seeing right now in the marketplace? Are you still seeing that openness is growing? Is there an optimistic tone in coming up with solutions right now? There's a great deal of that. I, and when 988 uh, came to fruition, uh, Dr. Richard McKeon, a close friend and colleague of mine from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, said that it's going to be absolutely transformative for crisis care in the United States. And I, I would go further to say it's going to be transformative for mental health care in the United States. Um, and I would go even further to say that um, something that my daughter said to me when she was 18, uh, so, you know, several years ago, she's 24 now. At 18, you're actually a lot smarter than you are at any other time in your life. Uh, so that figured I'd better ask her advice on what she thought of this new three-digit number for suicide and crisis services that was being talked about. And she said, Dad, I think it's going to do more than anything to eliminate stigma against mental illness in the United States. And I said, well, why, why do you think that? She said, because... Uh, we have a number for medical emergencies, but uh, if we have a number for psychological emergencies, people will know that it's real and they will know that it's going to require a very different response than having cops come to your door. Mm -hmm. and that is what we are trying to transform away from, Ban, is a public safety approach to mental health crises where it's going to be dangerous. Somebody is going to be harmed. And so we need to lock them away. We need to put them away anywhere from a psychiatric hospital to jails, which is now where most of the persons with mental illness are being warehoused who were once in hospitals. 
Um, it's it's uh, a it, it, and having police respond and, and especially in communities where uh, that have been historically oppressed um, uh, and 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 disproportion disproportionately uh, arrested by police, it's not welcoming mental health as 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 an issue that people would seek help for because they're going to get cops coming if if they call. So mm -hmm. that's that's what we're transforming away from is is, right. it, is is from a public safety approach to a public health approach, um, and I I imagine Bant thirty years from now, uh, our grandkids are going to be saying, "What they used to send police to your door if you thought about suicide." I hope so. I was at the Consumer Electronics Show to begin the year, and I was looking at all of these new technological ways to monitor your health. It's fascinating, all the monitors and gadgets that we're coming out with now. One of them offered an assessment to your mental well-being, your mental health, based on essentially, I guess, it must have been monitoring everything from kind of your sweat glands to your heart rate to, I don't know, some other triggers that they were assessing to see if your anxiety levels were going up. And, you know, I guess I would love to have someone tracking that stuff for me. It would almost make me feel like a professional athlete, right? Like, uh, yeah, Ben, you can monitor your well-being. And eventually we're, those those gadgets are going to become a lot more fine-tuned and, and more, you know, finely grained to focus specific on, specifically on various aspects of your mental health opposed yeah. to just your well-being. I'm I'm a uh, also a, a private practicing therapist and I have a couple of my clients who who track their stress levels and then I uh, I we use that data to talk about what was going on in their life when they were uh, at periods of highest stress and lowest stress and then how did they what were they doing at the time when they started to come down from the stress, what was helping them deal with that? So as we get more finely tuned in our awareness of what's causing our stress and what's helping to relieve it, then we have more control over once we have that awareness of what right. we can and should be doing. And, and ultimately that is what, I mean, Ben, if we, if we, if everybody who had a mental health problem went to go seek care right now, it's no way that they could get it. No way. There's just not enough practitioners. What we really need to do is to help people help themselves and help each other and give them the tools to do it in addition to seeing professionals. All of that right. needs to be done. And technologies are going to be crucial, including uh, aspects of AI, which we believe that even in, you know at the professional level, artificial intelligence can augment our care, not replace our care, but give us more tools that might help us diagnose or might help us um, find what, what are the most effective treatments out there or might help us, um, you know, again, re remember to follow up with somebody, all sorts of things that, that could make our, our, our jobs more efficient and remind us of best practices. John, where are we in terms of these issues? Is it getting worse or where are we? It's a great question. Um, uh, you know, one could, could uh, I think, pr very persuasively argue that things have gotten worse. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of reasons for them getting worse. Um, but I, I would say probably, you know, the, the, you know, the, the biggest issues relate to uh, social fragmentation and disconnection. The more people feel alone, mm -hmm. um, uh, not just lonely, but feel alone, like, and, and feel like they're not understood or, uh, or, or, you know, alone with very negative thoughts and don't have support in their life. Um, you know, the, the Surgeon General uh, Vivek uh, uh, Murthy recently came out with a, a, uh, a, a report on loneliness and thought we should make that our top health priority because the evidence is really clear that that uh, loneliness and that in the kind of mental health stresses that that causes have huge impacts on our health. And I'll I'll be frank with you: the data for males and loneliness and mm -hmm. male 
mental and health issues and males in suicide and males in overall longevity are staggeringly uh, different and lower than they are for, for females. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so so uh, women are much better at maintaining and establishing new connections than men are. Yeah. Um, and so so uh, in terms of mental health, suicidality, we really need to do a better job of building our connections and building and rebuilding our villages, essentially, to come together and 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 feel less alone and more a sense of belonging to make a big difference. John, you obviously studied this. You are a PhD, a professor and the doctor in the space. But tell me a little bit of what kind of drove your interest in the space in the first place. Where does this uh, focus come from? I was first seeking opportunities as, as a psychologist, but I wanted to be a therapist since I was in ninth grade. And I think and wow. that was in ninth grade, I, I realized um, I, I felt really alone. I felt um, I felt like I was different than people, and I didn't want to be a part of any of the groups that people were a part of. I, I, not that I was antisocial. I just didn't. I just didn't feel like I felt like there was too much conformity and too much pressure to be something that I wasn't. Mm. I, and I I just didn't know how to navigate the situation. I felt really alone, and I met a person who. Uh, felt like I did, and we, uh, she was a, became a, a very close friend, and she said, um, "You know, I'm gonna go see my therapist today." And I said, "Really? What? What? Uh, what do you do in therapy?" And she said, "Kind of what you and I do is talk about what's going on and with our with our our feelings in our lives." And I thought, "Well, I can get paid to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do that." So that's where it started. But you know, as as I've as I've grown, I've grown to and, and become you know uh, much much more familiar with everybody in my space i've been inc increasingly inspired by anywhere from people who've lost loved ones to suicide to people who've survived suicide attempts um and my my daughter who's also had her own mental health struggles who's thankfully doing much better now but uh, again uh considering the, the the common numbers of young people that are suffering from mental health problems it is becoming increasingly the norm um, uh, or at least certainly not uncommon for young people to have periods of, of serious anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. And so all of that drives me. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware what drives me bad is not just the awareness of the suffering and the need, but I am so inspired by all of the people that I've seen who've gotten better. The thing that I always struggle with though here. John is, I think of my own childhood and growing up and all of the problems and challenges that have been well documented in terms of what life was like in the 80s and 90s with bullying and drugs and non-tolerance and all of these types of things. And it, it's always hard for me to understand why things are worse now when I look at my own children and they're 10 times more tolerant, 10 times more aware and accepting than I'd ever seen anyone be in previous generations. And so that's kind of like a paradox that I struggle with a bit. No, that's a very interesting observation, Bant. Um, how is it that, that, that kids can be more aware and seemingly socially conscious and socially emotionally capable yeah. yet, um, um, and have more of the tools and awareness than we ever had at, that, at those young ages. But um, man, why are they suffering so much? And it, you know, on one hand, um, what's true is that they're, they're also much more aware of and, and willing and able to talk about their anxiety and depression in ways that, that we were not. Mm. Uh, uh, so, so it, it, there is an openness to discussing it, but I, that doesn't mean that the prevalence, um, is the same. I think the prevalence is greater and it is because, um, I, unquestionably screen time has been a major issue. And I don't mean just mm. social media. I mean, just looking at your damn phone. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, looking at YouTube. Um, but the amount of time that, I mean, you've seen it kids sitting together at a table um, and they're all convening just like we would have at the lunch table back in, you know, in junior high and they ain't talking to each other. 
They're all looking right. at, the phone, at, at each other's at their own phones. And maybe their for their source of sharing is, hey, check this out. Right. But but it's not it's not a conversation. Right. And that sense of, of not having conversations means a lot of people are having to have those in their head, if having them at all. And that's not the best place to have conversations because that sense of normalizing, <laughs> that sense of problem solving, none of that develops uh, when you're just, um, I'm alone. And, and I think that's, that's a huge problem that we're all, that, that young people are suffering from now. Do you guys look at things like the awareness levels of things like the 988 crisis response number? How aware are, are Americans? There's been a number of surveys and they change over time. I've seen uh, surveys that range anywhere from 20% to some odd 40%. Okay. Um, but, but that changes when you ask them, do you know exactly what it's for? They might know 988, but, you know, literally, I mean, I'd say about um, uh, you know, seven out of 10 people who you ask if they know what 988 is and who say they know, they know they've heard of it. Well, seven out of 10 will tell you, um, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what it does. Uh. So, so the sense of what it's there for, and then when they're told what it does and asked, Okay, now that you know what it's going to do, do you think you or someone you care about is uh, likely to call? And the overwhelming majority say, oh, yeah, yeah, that will happen sometime in my lifetime. Absolutely. So once they understand the value of it, uh, the, 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 the sense of, of noting and, and, and appreciating its utility seems to be pretty universal. I mean, the utility and benefit would be without question from my perspective, I just really had very little knowledge of it myself. So I'm sitting there thinking, wow, if I, if I don't know, and I know a lot about a lot of things, it means that probably there's a lot of folks that don't really have a full sense of uh, where to call and when and, and, and how, and it seems like a great, great thing. So uh, anybody watching this today, spread the word 988 is the magic number. So hopefully that'll get things going. But John, I mean, here we are in 2024. It's an interesting beginning of a year as we sit in the United States. There seems to be a quiet optimism right now that maybe things might get a little bit more stable in the U.S. at least. And yet... You know, we have anxiety filled things like the election that will populate every media outlet in the country for the next uh, 11 months. So tell me more about what you see on the landscape for 2024. Well, 2024 is, um, yeah, there, it's going to be a time of, um, I mean, there, there's, as I mentioned, that sense of connection is is really important in mental health. Um it's it's a it's an odd scenario now where um, what there's a lot of tribalism going on essentially in, in the political landscape where, where you're either with us or against us, yeah. um, and so yeah, there's a sense of connection with those whom whom you feel like are with you, um, uh, and and you're fighting for something in common. Um, but there is uh, an animus, a uh, 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 hostility that is also bred in the process, um, which means that there are going to be losers and angry people, um, uh, no matter how this thing turns out. And, and so, you know, what, what I think is incredibly important for us to remember is um, what is it that we love about the people in our lives and stay connected to that? And what do we, what we all, what are we struck by awe in our lives? These things that, that give us meaning together beyond just the, those things that, uh, that tear us apart. So, uh, you know, anywhere from enjoying nature with others, uh, we all looking at something majestic and beautiful our jaws drop together. We look at each other knowingly, complete strangers, and say, isn't this beautiful? And in this moment, we're all part of something. 
And that can happen in a number of ways. It certainly can happen, you know, in sharing things with people that we love, staying off the areas that, that divide us, but staying more focused on what is it that we enjoy about each other and what is it that we, um, we, can, we, can, and we can share together. Uh, it's it's just really important for us to focus on those things that we're grateful for in each other um, and in this world so we don't so easily you know draw into tribes and and kind of tap into this primitive uh, hostility that we may have with our tribe versus the other I mean, we're all on the same boat, ultimately. Well, it has been amazing speaking with you, John. We've been speaking with Dr. John Draper. He is the president of research and development at Behavioral Health Link. And we've been really talking about the broader mental health space. John, if someone wanted to learn more about what you and the team are working on at Behavioral Health Link, where's the best place to reach you? The best place is to go to our website, uh, and we can flash that up on the screen so people can see that. But Behavioral Health Link um, is a serve. I think one of the things that makes us so good at, 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 at developing technology is that we're providers of crisis services. Yeah. Uh, we, we know how what the impact is of doing good work at the right time with in the right way with people and, and also can see if you don't do it right, then there are outcomes that are highly undesirable. So that drives our sense of purpose and drives our, our, our knowledge about what can and should happen with the tools that we're providing our counselors who are doing the crisis care. So our, our, our sense of caring is really built into the DNA of our software. Yeah. We understand that crisis care can be caring. It's not just something that we we do because we have to we do it because we care yeah well i think it's absolutely critical and i'm so happy to hear about all the progress that you and the team are making uh, i mean i i think about raising my own two children in in new york and um literally uh, it, whilst they were in high school literally in the the four years of high school uh two people committed suicide uh, while they were in school. And as a parent, you feel paralyzed, helpless, confused. Uh, there's a ton of blame that goes around. Everyone's blaming everyone. And so what I take away today is I'm heartened by the fact that we're dealing with the crisis issues, those acute moments, which is at least we're starting to get to a point where we can handle something like that. And then you and the team are now layering that. You're starting to get to the next phase, which is like, okay, well, there's an acute problem. However, you know, that needs to go into bucket one, bucket two, combination of bucket one and bucket, bucket seven, you know, and, and we do that in a smart, fast, efficient way, which is great. And so, you know, kudos to you and the efforts that you're making and works. I'm excited to see what comes out of everything in 2024. And we look forward to having you back on the Uncaged Show. Sounds great, Fant. I really enjoyed it. 